All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the March 30th, 2020 Hadley School Committee uh, meeting via Zoom. So thanks for joining us virtually from the comfort of your homes. Um, for the agenda today, uh, if I could get a motion to call the meeting to order. A motion. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Great. Is there any public comment for tonight? Hold on, let me pull up the, excuse me, I'll check. No, not at this point. Okay. And we have public comment in the meeting a second time after the report in case people join us then. But at this point, we don't have any. Okay, great. I understand there are no adjustments to the agenda for tonight. Nope. So we will move right into the presentations and discussion items, starting with 4A, Principal Beck, appointed superintendent. Yes, so congratulations, our high school principal, middle and high school principal at Hopkins Academy, Brian Beck, has been appointed the superintendent of schools for Gil Montague Regional School District. We want to congratulate Brian. I know he's going to do a great job in Gil Montague. I'm incredibly grateful for the service that he's given to Hadley Public Schools since I've been there and since before I arrived. So congratulations and thank you to Brian. And I wanted to let the school committee know that my plan after a lot of thought is I believe, I would like to recommend that we post internally for an interim one year principal position at Hopkins Academy, given the current situation that we're in right now, our ability to pull together a meaningful search for a very important position, I think is limited. And uh, I believe that we have highly qualified people internally. They do a wonderful job for us at Hopkins. So I would like to post that internally as an interim one year Hopkins Academy principal position. And, um, would certainly like to hear the thoughts of the school committee on that. It does not require a school committee vote, but I absolutely am interested in hearing thoughts from the school committee on proceeding that way. Yeah, um, this is other. So first of all, Brian, um, you know, thank you for the years of service that you've given us and uh, I really appreciate it. Also, um, some of us were involved in the interview process and getting a chance to um, you know, advocate on your behalf and share our personal connections that we've had with you um, with the Gil Montague Regional School District. So uh, congratulations to you and we will miss you tremendously. Um, as to Annie's proposal, I think uh, just given it, as she framed it, the I mean, I would definitely uh, support the idea of given the current time that we're in internal candidate and giving us time to form a search committee um, then in the future but I'd like to hear from everybody else on the committee. I wanna echo your uh, comments, Heather, Brian, it's been a, a wonderful six years with you. You have really um, uh, yeah. helped the team bring it um, Hopkins to um, a wonderful place. And I'm personally very happy for you that you'll be uh, living so close to your new, um, right. your new school district. They're lucky to have you. Um, even if, we weren't living in as uh, strange a time as we are right now. I would suggest that a, an interim role uh, would, would help us find the right candidate uh, in light of the fact that it's you know, almost April and we'd be moving really quickly to fill that role. Um, but especially now, uh, I think it's really important to have a steady hand on the tiller, find someone who really knows the staff and the system understands um, the things that are already in progress and helps us carry over and transitions to um, a very um, intentionally selected uh, individual who um, fits what Hadley needs at this point. Hey, Annie, when would you, um, in a typical year, maybe there's nothing um, I don't know if there's a typical timeline. When would you look to hire a principal and what's the length of time it takes from start to finish to bring one on? So typically the steps in any principal search would involve, um, and so the steps kind of indicate to you about how long it takes. So let's say, 
maybe it takes four weeks of getting input from parents and the community, getting input from faculty. That could be surveys, that can be focus groups. It depends on how you want to get that input. What kind of characteristics and attributes are most important to them? What would they like us to be looking for um, in the next school leader? And uh, so you get input, you identify a search committee that will usually the first part of the search committee will do both screening and the first line of interviews. The principal under mass ed reform under the law is an appointment by the superintendent. But typically, just as we did with Hadley Elementary School, there would be a search committee that is comprised of uh, parents, student rep, faculty rep, um, others that do that screening of paper and initial interviews and then recommend uh, at least three viable candidates to the superintendent. Um, and you may also include sometimes, just as you do with superintendent searches, sometimes when we did this with the elementary uh, position, site visits and um, having uh, the, the finalists talk with the public. So we did that at Hadley Elementary School. Jen Dad was one of the people that um, addressed the public. There was a night for parents to come out and meet the principal candidates and give their feedback. Um, so that entire process, uh, that could take you about, let's say four to four to six weeks, depending on how you're able to schedule interviews and then selecting in advance, deciding things like how you're getting that input so that the screening committee can kind of do their job effectively. Uh, when you do this, I would say a lot of job announcements start coming out, job postings start coming out uh, around January, as early as January or February, because people often have notification clauses in their contracts. Um, and so most people are signed by the spring for a new job. So that's why the winter is sometimes late winter, or early spring, you're trying to do the actual search, like getting the candidates in, getting them interviewed, and depending on how long you're going to, how many steps you're going to have in that would kind of tell you how you time it. And we'd start getting input from people as early as after getting the school year underway, we'd want to get start getting input from, from people as early as late fall, you know, after school, right after school started. Okay. So, um, Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is basically even without this time, it would be on a very accelerated timeline in order to try to bring in a new, a new body um, into, into that position. For September? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Extremely accelerated, yes. Mm -hmm. And even uh, if you attempted to do that, chances are you're picking someone who's in a position that you're that's leaving their organization in a lurch. Potentially, yes, because you don't, you wouldn't get it um, kind of sorted out, all of the details sorted out for a good month. I mean, think about even if you started doing it right now, you, you don't, in some systems, the superintendent would just simply post screen unilaterally decide, and that goes really quickly. But if you're getting community input, it takes a little bit longer, right? So to your point, Humera, that even if you moved at lightning speed, somebody is, is informing, giving notice to their district at the end of April, early May. It's kind of short notice. And I think there may be a comfort aspect with having somebody internal, at least through this next period of time, given just the uncertainty of things um, where we are now. Agreed. Absolutely. So Annie, you said this is not something that we need to vote on, but just uh, I think um, in general, are folks uh, on the committee comfortable with moving forward with this approach? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Great. Perfect. All right. And congratulations, Mr. Beck. Well done. Thank you. Thank you all very much, by the way, Humera, Heather, and Paul for meeting with the, the Gil Montague School Committee members on my behalf. Um, also, thank you to the entire committee for the entire time that I've been here. I've, I feel like this is the most professional 
school committee with which I've ever had the opportunity to work as a school administrator. And, um, you know, in particular, thank you to Annie and, and April Camuso, who, uh, from whom I've been able to learn a lot over the last seven years. And, um, you know, certainly the strength of this district is its faculty, its families, and its students together make a team that really you'll have a hard time finding a team of, of learners and educators that's as strong as we have here in Hadley. And uh, it's pretty sad to leave that, but thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. You'll miss us, but good luck. <laughs> I'm happy for you. <laughs> already do, and I'm not even done yet. <laughs> You'll miss us. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. All right. Uh, we're going to move to 4B, change of date for the Europe field trip, uh, obviously, um, <laughs> April 2021. April. Sure, thanks. Yeah, so we actually started this process a little bit on the early side, um, mm -hmm. but then that accelerated quickly. Uh, and as you know, there's been a lot of different changes <laughs> over the last few weeks, but I think we have pinned it down to having our trip um, run next April. So I did a, a survey to get some input about whether February or April would be better for the people who were already signed up. We only have three of the 21 students who are canceling off the trip entirely. Um, one's a senior and the other two are juniors. Um, so everybody else has been rolled over and hopefully that can proceed. So we are looking to go over April vacation of 2021, same exact trip. Um, England, Ireland, and Wales with extension to Paris. So if possible, I guess the other thing I'm looking to do besides changing the date to next um, next April would be to open it up to potential new students in case new students wanted to add on since there is time for that to happen. So those are kind of the two things that I'm looking for at this time. And yeah, that would so be, sorry, go ahead, Tamara. Year, next year's ninth graders? Um, so the current freshmen and sophomores. So next year's sophomores and juniors. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to open up to them um, and will help offset, you know, folks who are maybe not able to join in April, despite now being thinking that they could. Um, and just as, you know, on a personal note, because I know a couple of us on this committee have been uh, interacting with you on these dates. I appreciate, you know, your willingness to communicate with the parents, with seeking input on the dates, on preferred, you know, modes of moving forward and just a continuous communication given uh, it did escalate quickly and it changed <laughs> every day. So yeah. mm -hmm. much appreciated on that front. Yeah, I think it's slowed down for now a little bit at least. <laughs> yes. um, so that should be helpful. And for people who are who, you know, are still enrolled, they still have some of those options, which is nice. EF did open up a lot of their options more so once uh, President Trump um, changed some of the the travel restrictions. But yeah, hopefully we, it's been a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is something that the school committee would vote to approve, just because we're amending two parts of it. And so that could be as simple as just um, approving the, the changes to the trip as presented, but this does require a school committee vote. Sure. So are there any questions about changing the dates of the trip um, and participants as amended? My only question is, um, was there a price that was locked in when this was first? Um, and is that price going to be honored for the, for the new date? Yeah, so at one point it was not going to be honored. <laughs> and then that changed maybe a week or two ago. And they are now honoring it. I think when all of this started, the tour company even didn't realize how much uh, the world was going to change and it was going to escalate. So originally they weren't willing to give as much and they weren't willing to lock those things in. But the price is locked in now for all of the students who are being rolled over. Um, and then for the new students, it kind of gets locked in for temporary time. There's like a window where it'll be one price. And then I think that's meant to motivate them to book. Um, and then that can change. But once they put down their deposit, their price is locked in. But yes, everyone who was signed up is no longer losing any money, nor do they have to pay any more money. They can just go next year. Awesome. 
Thanks, April. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, is there a motion to approve the changes to the Europe field trip and participants? So motion to approve the changes to the uh, Europe trip. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to 4C, revised school choice seats by grade. So Keith Shannon so correctly figured out that it was a challenge for me to add to 50 last month. So I will have you know that in all this virtual time, I've been taking some math classes. And yes, the point was it was supposed to be 60 seats. So the reason I wanted to bring it back to the committee is that I changed all the seats downward at Hopkins, but actually in some cases you can see in your packet, not every grade, but some grades were meant to be 60 and not 50. I have to scroll down to that page. And if you have questions about any of the school choice recommendations, both uh, Jen Dowd and Brian Beck are here to respond to any questions. Nothing has changed with the recommendations for Hadley Elementary School, but they are both here if you have any questions. Okay, and this is something we do need to vote on. Yes. So are there any questions about um, the revised school choice seats available other than Annie's math? <laughs> That's <laughs> lots of faith in the community. Nobody's nobody's logged on the Zoom. That's I, I think my only question is, um, I, I believe some of the classes right now are pretty small. I want to mm -hmm. say uh, the current senior class is somewhere between 20 and 30, perhaps it is. Um, and so going up to 55 would represent, you know, a fairly decent bump. Um, if we were to achieve these um, upper limits of um, three grades at 60 and, and three at 55, would we be looking to hire to support the current staff or are we saying that the, the current uh, staffing structure can support these numbers? So if um, I basically put these numbers together based on the number of teachers that we had teaching at each grade level and what we typically see at Hopkins is a larger contingent of students coming in in both seventh grade and ninth grade um, those are also the places and typically in ninth grade we also see the largest outflow as we compete with um, students going to Smith vocational um, and so I asked Rex to just integrate for ninth grade in particular is, is a place where we're currently planning on two sections. And so that's why those numbers are lower. So they take into account existing staffing um, as the basis for establishing those numbers at each of the grade levels. Great, thanks, Brian. Any other questions? Okay, um, is there a motion then to approve the updated 2020 to 2021 school choice seats available? Motion to approve the 2020 to 2021 school choice seats available. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thumbs up. Okay, we're going to move on to. Um, My microphone wasn't unmuting. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you're good. <laughs> Got the visual. Uh, program of studies. Uh, we have an enclosure on that. Brian. Yep, there's just um, some relatively minor changes because all of the courses, which I did include on here that you guys had approved back in February, gave us the opportunity to get going with the early stages of registration and getting information across to students. Uh, we wanted to approve the remainder of it, hopefully, hoping that um, both Innovation Pathways and Early College High School, we would have heard back. We have, in fact, heard back from Innovation Pathways. And thank you to Dr. McKenzie and the hard work also of uh, Kathy Nigella and Nick Simmons um, and uh, other teachers who made contributions in the science department uh, and other areas of the faculty toward putting this grant proposal together. And congratulations to you, Annie, for forgetting this in these two content areas, but um, the three changes that are in this version of the program of studies 
is just a brief description at the outset of the world language requirements, basically just clearly delineating that we offer French and Spanish and that students need to have at least two years in a row to be considered for um, standard state college admission and just putting that at the, at the front of um, the section on world languages. And then there's just a brief um, note in the art history course description where Karen Sousey had piloted this course over the last year and uh, has realized that she's going to need to divide it into two courses, art history one and art history two. So there's just a note in the description which divides it uh, in terms of what the curriculum covers. And the course registration process will take care of whether we run art history one or art history two. Um, and then the last edition is a fairly substantial section. I think it's two and a half pages on page 38, the uh, edition of the Innovation Pathways Program as part of our programming here at Hopkins Academy. And that's it for, for this change. Great, any questions from the committee? Uh, no questions, but congratulations um, to the team on securing the Innovation Pathways um, grant and, and opportunity for Hopkins. It represents a really important differentiator that is so valued by companies and it's really going to differentiate um, and, and help Hopkins students set themselves apart from a growing and competitive field. So thank you for that. Yeah, agreed. This is definitely, uh, it's, it's great to see kind of some of the things that we've been talking about over the past few years kind of come to fruition and in, in this um, course of study and options available to the students. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so this is also something that we need to vote on. If there are mm -hmm. no questions, then is there a motion to approve the Hopkins Academy Program of Studies? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, Brian. Thank you all. Hopefully I'll have Thanks, the chance Brian. to see some of you in person someday again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. In a, in a socially Thanks, distanced Brian. way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we can you guys can join me as I walk over when I see Annie's car and wave to her outside the window from across the driveway. <laughs> I've been doing that for six years for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I socially distanced way before it was responsible and popular. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, Annie, you're up next. Update innovation and early child, yes. early college designations. So uh, we're halfway there. So great news. We have, as we talked about, received the Innovation Pathways designation. Lots of innovative programming at a school that's currently not meeting, but we're going to, it's going to be meeting next year. So we've received Innovation Pathways. We heard from early college this morning. They're looking to reschedule interviews. Our interview for the early college high school. So we've made it all the way to the interview stage, which is the final stage. And then they make the, the determination. Our interview was scheduled for March 17th. And of course, schools had closed then. So uh, we heard from them today. They've given us some options if we would like to reschedule the interview or um, resubmit designation in the fall. I am very eager to move ahead with the interview, but this is a joint proposal with Greenfield Community College. So Mr. Burns and I will be speaking with the folks from Greenfield Community College to see how they feel about it. And I will keep you up to date on what happens next month. Oh, good luck with that. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, for, for F, formative evaluation superintendent. Yes, and so the law requires that superintendents, typically it happens in February, our February meeting was that one right at the beginning of March and it was very short. So we moved this to now. Um, and yes, then it's required by law that you do a summative again at the end of June um, or right at the first, early in July or late June. At this formative evaluation, it can be as simple as you folks letting me know if there are any concerns that you have about progress on any of uh, the goals or things that we're working toward as a district. So it can be as simple as letting me know of any concerns that you have. You may also elect to do a formal rating. You don't have to do that. You can just do that at the summative time. So 
whatever you would like to do, but just know last year, I think last year, you just let me know that there were no concerns at the time and um, just press on. And we did the full evaluation at the end of June. And I did enclose in the packet and I also shared it with you as a Google document so you could see the evidence and the hyperlinks, um, what I believe the status is. And all of those activities are from the district strategy document that we did together in August. Um, so each one of those activities are things that are on the strategy document and then the um, notes and the progress I just indicated what I think is where we're at with each activity and provided corresponding evidence where I could. Great, yeah, hey, thank Annie. you. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so just looking through this, are there things you're concerned about will be delayed? Yeah, so what are, there's one great now, of course, this is sideways, but um, my red, so, um, so the not met, so let me start at the beginning rather than scrolling backwards, it's not helpful. I will just identify the places that are not met. So I highlighted those in red. Um, so one is um, we had hoped this year to administer a social and emotional screening tool at Hopkins Academy. We have gotten started, we have a, positive behavior interventions and support team that is meeting at Hopkins Academy. And we do have a consultant from UMass, Dr. Sarah Whitcomb, who is working with that team. Um, so that's where we are in relation to that, but we have not administered this social emotional universal screener. Um, we wanted to get the PBIS team up and running before we administered the screener. And I definitely don't see us administering the screener. I, I don't, we're not gonna administer it. Uh, assuming that we resume school in May, we wouldn't administer that in May. Um, and um, active bystanders, that's in red, not because it has, we've lost ground with that, um, but uh, we pretty much have the same level of participation. That's a good rate of participation. It's over a third of the students are involved in trained active bystanders, but it hasn't expanded. And um, we did not do, we have not started, and so I don't foresee it happening, an evaluation of the effectiveness of restorative justice, justice or restorative justice framework at Hopkins Academy. This has been something that the faculty has talked about a great deal, um, making sure that they, they appreciate and value restorative justice and understand that aversive punitive consequences do very little to modify behavior. But um, there has been a lot of discussion about whether or not some of the restorative practices were having the, their intended effect because we still want behavior to improve. And when we say behavior to improve, we want people to, to be more responsible to their community, their community of peers and adults. So in some cases there were concerns that there were some behaviors that just were not improving. Um, so we have had good discussion, but we do not have a formal evaluation. So where I said that we would formally evaluate, I won't be able to say to you in June, um, We've evaluated the impact of restorative practices using the following methods, and here are the conclusions that we've drawn. Um, and so, review and improve reports of student progress to parents and families. So we are we have a lot of systems in place at both the elementary school and at Hopkins Academy whereby families are made aware of their child's academic and social and emotional progress and how they're doing. But we would like to um, provide even more, I guess. So we've had some conversations about how some of the data that we evaluate, whether it's data through our literacy formative assessments in FAST or um, some of our PBIS data, how can we how can we share that with families in a meaningful way? 
And I attend PBIS team meetings at both schools. Again, a lot of really good conversation, but we haven't landed on a way of sharing the data that in a way that would be meaningful. I mean, we can send home reports of charts and graphs and numbers, but we really haven't sorted how we'll do this in a way that that is meaningful to families. And of course, the school business, uh, not school business, school building authority, we will be resubmitting that application. They've extended that deadline. So that has a red not yet, but we will be submitting it. It's down to in May. And I think that's it for things that, so those are the big things. I'm not, uh, yeah, not administering the social emotional screener and not having a formative evaluation of restorative practices. And I don't foresee either of those things happening. Those won't come out of the red before the year's over. Thanks for that question, Paul. That's a great question. Um, and, I, you know, I would say going back to that goal three, um, review and improve reports of student progress sent to parents and families. I mean, even some of the work that you're doing now, Annie, with communications and what the faculty are doing with, um, you know, tailored communications, uh, websites, you know, just even it, more, I think, transparency with parents just because we're, we're here and we're seeing it. Uh, on on the front lines, right along with the teachers, um, I think there's actually a lot of room for uh, some positive progress in that area. Just given the nature of where we are right now, and having to communicate um, via you know video blogs mm -hmm. and other things that you're doing, and how the teachers are outreaching to students, um, I could see where you know in kind of the past fail type grading system that there might be requests for just more information about, um, especially in the case of a did not meet requirements, kind of what what was mm -hmm. underneath that. But I think that this is an area that I, I see as possible. Um, just we never would have foreseen this, but mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to expand on how progress is communicated to parents and families. But overall, I mean, I, I think focusing on the non-red things, I, I think this has been tremendous progress in many of these areas. And um, I don't want you to sell yourself short. I know we went through the red areas, but man, um, there's so much that's been moving forward that is just so encouraging. That's the thing that really struck me is, um, you know, is, with any uh, ambitious plan for all the things, you know, all the, all the things that we want to accomplish. Uh, there's always going to be those stretch goals. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are going to be those things that we um, are just not able to get to in light of unexpected things like mm -hmm. pandemics. Um, but to see just how many things you uh, met um, and also made significant progress towards meeting, um, I, I have to say this is pretty uh, remarkable. Um, this year has been a very productive one for you. And I, I, I for one, am um, really uh, pleased with the progress. I would like to echo what my colleagues have said. Um, and also on that topic of uh, communication with the homes and just the new opportunities and stuff, I'd also like to uh, just take a second to give you some serious props for a lot of the communications already come out so far um, to parents and to students and how nimble um, and reactive uh, Hadley has been throughout this entire process. Um, I have close personal connections with other school districts that um, are not, that we could definitely be held up as an example to show some other school districts as some best practices. And a lot of that is on you, Annie, and I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Heath. Thank you very much. I'm good. So, so overall, uh, it sounds like you've got really positive, formative feedback. I mean, we will we'll definitely, you know, go through the the steps that we need to go through at our mm -hmm. forthcoming meeting, Annie. But this okay. has been, um, I hope, even just the exercise for you going back through these and kind of highlighting the things that were met and the things that are moving forward, just encouraging um, for you as well. So. 
I think you should be proud of where I know you are, but the, again, we're proud of where the district has come and where we see it headed. Yeah, the district is doing great. I'm grateful. I mean, obviously, I don't have to state the obvious. It's not, it really isn't about me. It's about all the people who work in the district. It's about the elected leadership in the district. And I will always set goals that are way more than I can do. I think actually it was Paul when I set the goals last year. I think, Paul, you were the one that said, that's kind of a lot. And so I will always set, I will always set goals I can't reach. It's just, it's just who I am. That, that's, I'll always do that. But thank you. It's, the district is doing a great job. So thank you for that. And FY21. We'll Great. Yeah. So speaking of goals, FY21 budget <laughs> yes. update. It's an interesting time, right? Uh, so this has not changed terribly. The last time, or a great deal, the last time we were together, it was over four. There was an additional position of an educational team leader, an ETL in the budget. Because the increase was over 4%, the school committee said, let's not add any positions. Let's at least try to get this below four. And then uh, Mr. David Nixon, the town administrator, had to reduce all budgets, and he reduced the school department budget by $26,000, which I have to say that this is where we're at. This is where we're at right now. I will bring, unless there's something that the school committee would like changed prior to, I will bring this draft to the finance committee tomorrow evening at 530. This is not the final budget. At, and we'll set our April meeting date and we should set a backup date because that April date is the one that's most important. That's the public hearing of the budget that must occur before a budget can go to town meeting floor. So it's still in draft form until that public hearing. But David Nixon had to cut from all town departments. The school department budget received a $26,000 cut. And again, um, that is, is extremely uh, reasonable. I know there are towns all through uh, Western Massachusetts. Uh, my colleagues have it much harder than I do in many, many ways. So what's changed to get to that reduction um, is one, uh, one big change and it is that we reduced an expenditure in contracted services for special education. And although we, although we, we, we could be required to pay that um, because of the age of the person, at this point in time, there's been no indication that, um, that this is a service that the individual is going to use, even though we are we are consistently reaching out. So that is where we went to make that reduction. That's where we reduced some of the expenditures. I also reallocated some expenditures. So we have expended, we had money in professional development. So in the last iteration you got, it explained that there's a significant investment in professional development to support some of these things like expanding positive behavioral interventions and supports and tiered systems of support and literacy. So those are some of the folks from UMass that come and help us to train and develop our teams in behavioral teams and our tiered systems of support teams and also that provide clinical supervision to our mental health staff. I reallocated some of that funding into um, food services and into contracted services custodial. I made it clear in this presentation to, fin to the finance committee that um, I think that if, if we could not make other adjustments to the budget, I would suggest to the school committee that we fund some of that professional development out of school choice if we had to next year. Um, but we may not have to do that because again, we don't know yet. We don't have final numbers for Smith vocational. There's still, even at this point, a lot of unknowns. The reason that I reallocated that funding is I just wanted to reflect the reality. And Chris and I talked about this at length. So I hope that after we resume, we come back to school. I hope that a lot has changed in our world and that, um, 
we don't see other cycles of mitigation and social distancing like what we are in right now. But um, it is, it's not, uh, it's not hard to imagine that we could have another cycle or two of um, COVID-19 that could create problems and closures next year, right? So we're not sure what's going to happen. And even in some cases, if they're short-term, the reason we put more money into custodial contracted is to consider uh, deep cleaning and disinfecting of schools if we have to do that multiple times next year. And uh, for food services, because although they just changed the law that we will get reimbursed in this time period for the meals that we provided, even though we weren't originally eligible for reimbursement, that may not be true next year. And we would still want to offer food to families if we had to close. So that's what that reallocation is. And this um, does not need to be voted right now. You'll vote the budget at public hearing in April because things could still change between now and that public hearing. But I wanted you to review what we're bringing before uh, finance committee tomorrow. And of course, finance committee could then turn around after tomorrow and provide a different number, which means we'd make additional adjustments before April meeting. Hey, have you heard... Have you heard any of that about town looking to cut budgets just because I know revenue is going to be lower? I don't know if any of the federal funding will help offset that. Yeah. So I did ask David that question. I expected another cut beyond the 26,000. And right now, um, he didn't uh, suggest that. Now, it certainly could happen. And I would imagine he's not suggesting that at this point, because we just don't know what's going to be reimbursed, what the federal government will provide the state government, and what the state government will provide municipalities. So yeah. um, we could be in a position, and, and we do, because you've seen the, the change, the incredible increase in school choice coming in this year, and a decrease in school choice going out. So we should have a healthy school choice balance. And that's really important. We will have more money in school choice than that policy, kind of like that minimum floor. Um, because if there are 9C cuts next year, which is completely 9C is mid-year cuts from uh, the governor to municipal aid, which then to make that up, it's it's not just, it's like having a cut mid-year in federal government, right? You've got to do it's, you've got to do more than just stop spending, right? You, you're, you got a lot of catch up to do. Um, but we'll make sure that, that we're even prepared for any mid-year things that could happen. Okay. Any other questions on the budget adjustments? All right. Okay, let's move on to the... Um, 2020 to 2021 school year calendar. I thought we were done with this. You, we were done, but here is something. Jason and I read the unit, Mr. Burns and I read the unit A contract. We read it the same, but the membership, um, some folks in the membership said, no, no, you folks are misreading it. So um, we thought that it was students can't start any earlier than August 26th. And um, the membership said, no, that's not quite right. Staff can't start any earlier than August 26th. So that's what you see now is a change. Um, we have staff coming in, let me make sure. 27th and 28th. And 28th, and the students start that following Monday. Monday the 31st of Correct. August. Correct. So okay, we originally had staff coming in on Monday, um, the, 20... the 24th. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So that, so we made an adjustment and then had to change the quarter, kind of those marking period days for professional development. But no update to the end date of graduation, the 28th. No, no, um, we didn't the change the graduation. Correct. Okay. We didn't change. Right. The well, the last day of school would change and the last day of school changed because students are now starting um, on Monday and not, we had them before starting on maybe Thursday. 
Yeah, we had them yeah. starting on the Wednesday before. So the last okay. day of school will change for students. They, they're starting later and ending later um, by three days. Okay. Any concerns with the adjustment? No, I actually like that better because I've always wondered why you start a school year on like a Thursday. So <laughs> Yeah, so what used it. to happen, Keith, these strange things that school districts do that get into routines that kind of sort of make sense um, is uh, great. I've completely lost Zoom. I mean, you guys haven't lost me. There you are. You're uh, still there. Still there. Is that, is that, uh, it used to seem like it always worked out that teachers could come in on a Thursday, Friday, and then the students could have a four day week. Actually, excuse me, teachers came in on a Monday, Tuesday. Students had a three-day week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, four-day week after Labor Day, and a five-day week. It was like this nice buildup. Then it just hasn't worked out in a while. That's why it, we did it that way. Okay. Um, we need to vote on this. Yes, please. Yeah. Any motion. questions, concerns? No, just a motion to approve this calendar. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Great. Uh, let's move on then to developing norms as a committee for I. Yeah. So you all had this. We've looked at this. Nothing has changed in the packet, but you were just going to determine whether or not you wanted to formally adopt um, either the norms. And I did. I had a typo in them the last time you saw them, but formally adopt. Um, either the reflecting on norms and values, or if you wanted to adopt something different from MASC. Um, yes, so you you folks were deciding what you wanted to do in terms of adopting norms, yeah, or if you just wanted to talk about them. And I think at the time, um, some of the framing was given all of the policy review mm -hmm. and subcommittee, whether or not we wanted to bring those into a policy. Uh, and so the guidance from MASC was not to um, uh, necessarily put them into a policy document, but more vote them in uh, and make them public on the district uh, uh, website. And we can establish a regular you know, annual review um, I think at the time we were we were linking it to the April elections and bringing in of you know new committee members um, that this would be a good orientation and overview of our norms, but um, not necessarily adopting them into a specific policy for the district. Um, and you've got the background there in the packet on mm -hmm. from MASC about that. So can you remind us, Annie, um, which is our set of um, norms that we had looked at? That starts with the deep learning. Is that right? Yes, the right. Yep. Skip the first paragraph and starts with deep learning. Um, and then there are examples of actions, like how we put that value in action, inclusivity, diversity, growth, mindness, and growth mindset and kindness. So we can move to accept these norms and values as a as a school committee and then include it on our website, make it available for others to to see. Is that the yeah, sure. is that the recommended course of action? Yeah, and so, also some um, established like annually to review these uh, and to bring them forward for possible, you know, refinement. I think it makes sense to review it as part of our, uh, you know, retreats that we do. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're on an annual for those, but it makes sense that we continuously refresh with our, um, with that thinking at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Like, what what do we want to be um, each year? Uh, how do we want to improve each year? Um, so, with that, I make a motion to accept these, um, the reflecting on norms and values document. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that title, honestly. But I, uh, I motioned to move this document forward as our school committee norms and values. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I would probably just change that to uh, 
Hadley Public Schools norms and values. That I just have it read that when and I initially Claire, put that is it to, the school yeah. school committee. It's the school committee. Yeah, and maybe even strike that first paragraph, which gives yes. A, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. this was originally when I was just trying to give you all a starting point to think about, but. Um, yes, so I will strike the first paragraph and norms and values um, of the Hadley School Committee. Great, thank you. Great, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, the last presentation discussion item, continuation of compensation during scheduled closure, March 16th. I think this is... Yes. Through April Thank 7th you for catching that. Well, or May. I did the agenda <laughs> right. I did the agenda. Yeah. So I really want to make that clear to the public. And if any uh, faculty or staff are um, tuning into this, that the agenda was created prior to the extension of the closure. So Commissioner Riley has recommended that school districts continue to pay their employees during the school closure. And we have been paying our employees during the school closure. And it is my um, strong recommendation that that is something that we continue to do. Our employees are all participating either in some form of direct service to students. Some of our employees were making meals or putting together grocery delivery boxes. Some of our drivers were assisting with that. Um, our educational support professionals are doing check-ins with students and families, supporting teachers. We've actually reached out to see if some of them are, who are comfortable and, and good with technology it could be kind of uh, assigned to different grades to really help teachers um, do some of that work, which has been overwhelming for some of our staff. And our teachers obviously are teaching. Also, every single one of our educational support professionals puts together a professional activity plan every week where they lay out the activities that they have planned for the week, the families they'll be checking in with, the students they'll be checking in with, the teachers, the kinds of activities they'll support teachers with, and their own professional learning. Um, now, this is not this is not about me. This is about this district. We are just leagues ahead of a lot of places. So, our all of our ESPs have a Google Classroom that they can participate in. There have been great discussions. They are doing so much professional development, reading articles on all kinds of behavioral interventions and supporting struggling learners. Uh, two of our educational support professionals, as well as our school psych and our Title I reading teacher, attended an online training on how to deliver Read Live, which is one of our tier two, so a supplemental intervention for students who struggle in reading at the elementary school. They learned how to deliver that online and we'll be rolling out for parents. If you want us to do it, if you as a parent would like to do it, here's how you can log on to Read Live and do it. So we have, it's, it's just incredible. It's just awesome. So our staff is working. They are certainly not, um, hanging around and not working. They are working. Um, and even other departments, of course, our custodians are essential services staff. They are showing up every day. Um, we gave them the option of if they didn't feel comfortable for any reason, they didn't have to do that. They all wanted to show up. We have structured their schedule in such a way that they are either one at a time or incredibly far apart. And we no longer allow anyone to come into the building when a custodian is there. If a teacher needs to pick something up, they arrange an individual appointment with the principal. And that happens often in the evening. Brian's doing it tonight. That's why he's there tonight. There's no custodians um, to keep the custodians safe. So I say that more for just the viewing public that yes, employees can, uh, it has been recommended that employees continue to re receive compensation. And I strongly support this because they're working very, very hard in all departments. Okay, is this something we need to vote on, Annie? You don't, no, okay. I just want yep. you to know that's what we're doing and that's what we plan on continuing to do. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, that is it for presentations and discussion items. Mm -hmm. We're going to move now to Chris and the business manager reports. Okay, um, 
I think I scrolled past that one second here. Nope, there it no, is. No, it's way at the bottom for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the first item we have up is the uh, the budget expense report. Um, we're still in very good shape this year. Um, it's hard, when I'm splitting my screen, I make it very small here. So boy, I'm trying to read it. Two point four million dollars plus. Sorry, we have remaining to spend. Um, plus, we also have additional money in grants and. Um, the uh, school choice money that we have not used the full amount yet either. So um, you know, certainly enough to get us through the end of the school year. Um, you know, even with paying everybody, I mean, those obviously were budgeted anyway, so it, it's not like it affects us in any way um, from the budget at least. Um, so, you know, really not a heck of a lot to discuss at this point in time. Certainly, I can answer any questions you might have on it if you've uh, looked through it and something jumped out at you. Chris, I think my only question was, do you foresee any kind of savings from a facilities perspective with being, you know, having facilities closed for a month and a half? Yeah, there are uh, obviously some uh, probably minor savings um, items like the heat in the buildings has been turned down. I mean, you know, you can't shut it off, but it's been turned down from the level we typically keep it on. Um, even items like, you know, the electricity. I mean, we're obviously using less electricity in the buildings at this point in time. Um, from a non-facility standpoint, we have items like uh, substitutes. Obviously, we're not calling in any substitutes at this point in time, you know, for the for the past couple of weeks and for the next month going forward. So there will be savings in there as well. Um, but at this point in time, it's it's kind of tricky to, to really know, quite honestly, um, you know, if there are savings to be seen or not, other than those few items I mentioned to you. Okay, thanks. Um, half kidding. Is it too early to lock in prices for next year's heating oil? Um, well, it's too late to lock them in because I already have. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, I have to say I was pretty giddy with excitement at the price I got. Um, I'm not quite as giddy now as I was <laughs> when I got them because I, I guess I just didn't have my crystal ball out when I, uh, when I locked them in, I had no idea that they were going to fall this far. Um, but we did, you know, I, I, I was happy because we locked them in at $1.70 a gallon. Um, which, you know, is, is a great price. Obviously, mm -hmm. the price is lower now, but, um, you know, unfortunately, that's, that's the price we have. Still a good price. Yeah, I mean, it's better than we had last year. So, you know, that's kind of how I judge it. If the price goes down, I'm, you know, pretty happy with that. It's, it's a quarter a gallon less than we paid last year. So that's wow. You didn't foresee a global pandemic, Chris? Sadly, no, I wish I had um, for reasons, uh, I mean, even Multiple filling up my own house, for example, I, I did that a week before as well. So, you know, <laughs> don't consult me apparently when it comes to oil pricing, that's, that's my advice there. Um, but yeah, um, and, and we actually, we, we did lock in a slightly higher um, number of gallons this year as well, because we found that we don't run out of oil with what we've locked in, but typically we like to top the tanks off at the end of the year so that we start next year with pretty full tanks of oil. And we've been running out before we've had the opportunity to top them off. So we got an extra 4,000 gallons this year, hoping that'll uh, you know bring us through a little bit. So, uh, or next year, I should say. Um, and we'll probably have enough this year to top them off considering again that the, um, you know, the, the heat's been turned down very low for the past three weeks. So we'll see something there anyway. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, if there's nothing else with that, the next one I have, I just have to rotate it so it's not sideways here, um, is the revolving accounts report. Um, there's good and bad, quite honestly, to be uh, said with this report. 
Um, I always love to have a report where I have no parentheses around the numbers, um, you know, for the month of February at least. Uh, lunch, you know, we're back into the positive. Uh, preschool again into the positive. And uh, the, the downside, of course, to that is that, you know, these accounts, we, we did have lunch revenues be, uh, in March because you know, we had a couple of weeks of school. Um, so we had students paying for that. And we also get the money from the state a couple of months behind. So we actually you know, still saw some revenues of about $6,500 this month. Um, but going forward in lunch and preschool, we're gonna see a drop in those accounts basically just because of the fact that we're paying people and we're not getting revenue coming in to offset that. So, um, you know, while while we can uh, like to see the positive balance, it's it's probably going to dip into the negative. And at the end of the school year, those savings that I talked about, quite honestly, with substitutes and with with oil and electricity, will be used most likely to offset some of these uh, decreases in the revolving accounts. Hey, Annie, do you know how much food we're putting out on a weekly basis, how many meals, things like that? Right now, um, we are doing grocery boxes of perishables because we did not have a huge demand for meals. So Diane Zach moved to, for those people who were getting meals, moved to these arranging kind of grocery boxes because obviously otherwise our perishable food won't be there for us. Um, it's not going to be good when we come back to school. Right. So uh, she is in communication with those families and we will continue to remind people that if they experience any food insecurity at any time, they can reach out to her, they can reach out to me. It doesn't matter if they receive free and reduced lunch and we will do what we can for them and put them in touch with any other resources we can. Great, thanks. And can I, just before you move to the next report, Chris, because you said substitutes and we never clarified this bit for the school committee. Paul, do you recall at a school committee meeting, you said, wow, and the whole school committee said, how many days of substitute teaching does that represent? Do you remember that big, like $60,000 line or, and it right. brought, people had some questions. What we didn't realize or we didn't think of in that meeting is that subline because you all did which i would have done the same thing and i didn't correct it because i wasn't thinking all the way through you did the at a per diem rate wow that's a lot of sub days but right. please keep in mind from that subline is when we have a long-term sub because somebody's out on parental leave family medical leave and there's a long-term sub they and it's going to be a year, they automatically start making a B1 bachelor's one rate, and that mm -hmm. comes from the same place. Okay. So, parental, we just didn't point that out. And Chris and I had been meaning to make that clarification so the public didn't leave with, Do teachers ever go to work there? That's <laughs> yes, they do, and that it's not just that per diem rate that's taken out of that cell. Great, thanks. Sure. Now I can finally sleep at night. I know and, you've been, it, it's yes. been bugging me. I mean, I to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that was the worst of your problems, Paul. That's the worst. That's the top. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. Grant? So we also have the uh, grant report. A couple of these grant amounts are going to change slightly um, in a positive direction. Um, I have to be honest, I, I just don't remember the amounts, but you know, typically we get in the 240 SPED grant in Title I, we pick up a, a couple hundred bucks maybe in each of those. So um, I will update the amount um, that we've been awarded in those lines uh, on the next report that you get. Um, but we are uh, you know, moving along, spending them down. You can see uh, you know, some of the items we don't have a, uh, a huge amount left to spend. Um, the, you know, the Title II A, this you know, under two hundred dollars left. Um, even the uh, the two forty grant, which is our biggest grant by far, uh, we did pick up I think a few hundred dollars in that one because um, it brought it over one hundred and sixty four thousand dollars for the grant. But you can see we have you know under twenty thousand left to spend in that, and I'll probably just use that uh, quite honestly just with a with an expense transfer this week just to get it closed out fully. Um, you know, the, the other ones just going down, um, 
you know, Title IV is fully spent. Uh, the 262 grant is now fully spent. So those are going down nicely. Um, we also have some expenses um, that stay for schools and communities at the bottom. That one is now fully spent as well. Um, we, we got the invoices and have just paid them for the remainder of that grant. Um, so, you know, they're, they're moving along um, and they will all as, as typically, um, you know, be fully spent by June 30th, unless, unless there happens to be a grant in there that will run over uh, June 30th that we just, you know, did not plan on spending at all this year. Um, but anything else, we'll definitely uh, have them all spent by the end. Annie, can you remind us, are there any additional, uh, any open grants that you're still waiting to hear back on? Early College High School, that's not really a grant now, it's the designation. We received the mm -hmm. planning funds for that grant. Oh, no, that's not in your art. I'll add that on. And um, so we're waiting for the designation on that. And then, no, because I haven't submitted school business, school business, school building authority yet. And the school violence prevention grant, they extended the deadline. So I should be able, I intend to submit that one as well. So I don't think there's anything else I'm waiting on right now. Okay. And the early high school, um, the sorry, the, that designation that Chris, you're going to add, that was for this fiscal year? Yeah. So early college, okay. high school and innovation pathways, we received planning grants for both of those. We received funding to do the planning. And now we're just waiting to hear of it designation for one of them. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anything else, Chris? Nope. I just went to the next page. It's not me anymore. So nope. I guess that's it. <laughs> We're on to public comment uh, round two. Whoops. I had to check this thing. I don't think there's anybody. In I see no room. new participants. Oh, uh, that would tell you. Yes. So no. Yep. All right. We're all still here. Okay, moving on to our school committee reports and discussion um, policy. Tara? So we, we didn't end up meeting today, so we'll have an update hopefully for the next meeting. And we do right, have first reading yes. in there. Yeah, we're not it's voting first on it. Reading. Yeah, first reading of what we did last time. Yeah. That's right, and there was a packet that was circulated with all of the suggested changes. Um, everything was pretty straightforward. Any, can you recall, I think we went through these, did we not? Did we, did we go through these? Yes, yeah, so these are all the ones policy subcommittee did, then the packet with the track changes went out to the entire committee. This is first right. reading, it doesn't take any vote. Next meeting, you will vote. You will notice that one of the policies we did strike, it was one that Tara Humera, we had some questions about the survey policy, um, and so we just struck that one uh, at this point. And um, yeah, and then the vote will come at second reading next month. So any questions from folks on the first read? Okay. If not, it's okay. Is, is it okay, Annie, for in between now and the next meeting to send a, an email to either Tara or Humera separately uh, if we have questions on any of the policy changes. Absolutely. And then I would just ask that any, feel free to email anyone with that and we'll bring the questions to the next school committee as well. We can answer okay. them in between and then announce them at the next school committee. Great. Okay. Thanks for that update. Thanks for the work you guys are doing on those. Uh, the start time task force, Tara. So that one had been put on hold in light of everything going on right now. Annie has a lot on her plate. So we, I don't have any updates from the last time that we had talked yet. Start time in my house is kind of like, you know, whenever, <laughs> Just so, you know. <laughs> yeah, students are getting used to a later start time, aren't they? Yeah, across the board, right. I would say. Not in my house. I'd say he's starting Early. earlier and actually yeah. probably working until later. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say if you're a middle schooler or a high schooler, you're definitely starting later. Yeah. And staying up later. <laughs> that, that is the corollary. Yes. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Finance and tri board. Um, other than the budget updates you outlined, Annie, I have no update from finance or a tri board. Yeah. We haven't had any meetings that I've been part of. 
Right. So I'll just present to finance committee tomorrow and then let you guys know in April if there are any, uh, if they uh, tell us that we have to work with a different number. Great. Thank you. Fields and CPA update, Paul. Yeah, um, Chris can jump in. So it seems from the last meeting it was announced, you know, the Amasta was the lowest bidder. Um, that was finalized, correct, Chris? That's been announced. Uh, I think we need a shout out again to the uh, trustees for the school. Yeah. Did a very generous donation to help mm -hmm. uh, with some matching funds to help us um, couple with the CPA dollars that we have and the private donations we've received and the donations from banks. We're putting this all together. And, and Annie, and now that I think it's all wrapped up, it's something I'd like to, it's on my list to put together an email to, to describe this that we can send out publicly and just thank everyone. So um, we've got the funding lined up. We've got a, a contractor coming uh, awarded. It's really just a question of timing. You know, there might be an opportunity here that if, um, the fields will not be used this spring, and I know it's still just an if, that maybe uh, Omasta can start earlier and get out into the fields earlier, which would benefit next season because there's always gonna be a delay on this, right? There's, there's not only the work to do, but there's the turf that needs to regrow. So if we could start earlier, there's a possibility that next season won't be affected by this project. Um, so while it's a shame, the seniors may not get a chance to play baseball this year uh, if the season doesn't resume. Uh, it would if we got Omasta out earlier, we would not disrupt next year's baseball season and uh, and such. So uh, it's still to be determined. I know the MIAA is still talking about what's the future of spring athletics for the season, and Eric Sudnick has been engaged in that heavily. So I think it's all to be determined, right, Annie? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The MIAA actually met today, yeah. and um, they did decide that there would have to be three days of practice. The season is still on at this point. Um, there would be three days of practice beginning on May 4th before any games took place, and okay. then the season would run with, with um, tournaments through June 27th. Okay. So that's the current plan. Of course, you know, all that were to change, uh, you know, if if the reopen date changes as well, but um, that I, I literally just came out. I was checking my phone for it during this meeting and it, it came out on their Twitter. So um, well, thanks Chris. Yeah. Just a, a new update. Um, but you know, if, if it doesn't happen, then yeah, we will begin the project early just to kind of give us that cushion more or less. Um, we were, we were all emailing back and forth about this uh, over the weekend and, and my take was just, we might want to start it earlier, if at all possible, for no other reason than if we happen to get a rainy summer or something that right. just, you know, I mean, if it's pouring rain, you can't really work with equipment out in the field. It would just be a, a muddy mess. So, yeah. you know, we have no idea what the weather is going to be like, but it's always nice to be a little bit ahead of the game rather than behind. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and if folks are wondering, you know, we asked whether we could have a master working in part of the field and use the other part and just for safety reasons and given the extent of um, water management that they'll have to do across the fields, it's really once they're out there, it, the entire fields are off limits. Yeah, they were not um, interested, I guess is the best word to say, in having, um, you know, kids using the field when the equipment was on it. Um, sure. and, and I understand that, you know, I mean, it's uh, apparently they're going to have a lot of equipment there and, and it's just going to take up a lot of space and it becomes yeah. a, a safety issue. So yeah, we could reach out to them and ask that. I'll say thanks to you, Chris. You've done a great job helping to put this together. So uh, really Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Good work. Yeah. I'll Absolutely. just give one um, quick anecdote. Um, as you all know, my oldest son goes to private school and uh, last week they canceled, the entire network of private schools canceled baseball, uh, mirroring MLB, um, but also acknowledging that, uh, that social distancing is probably gonna mirror what colleges do. Um, and so anyways, um, I, I hope there, that is a silver lining that comes out of this, is that we can at least get the field started early. Yeah, that's sad for him, Humera. I'm sorry to hear that. 
Yes, um, I'm pretty sad too. Um, thankfully, it's not his senior year. As you may recall, he reclassified, so he has right. another another chance at a final year yeah. of baseball. Yeah. And Humera, any update on the collaborative that you'd like to share? Yes. So um, earlier this week on Wednesday, 23 board members from across the entire Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin County met for uh, for the first virtual board meeting. Um, the as you all know, CES has lots of different parts of its business. It runs a school. It has many uh, contracts providing services to juvenile justice systems and um, other um, public agencies, as well as providing uh, collaborative um, support services and uh, professional development services to its member districts um, and its entire uh, business across the board has been impacted by uh, this um, pandemic and um, it is now predicting to come in at a deficit in terms of its finances. They um, showed us the last five years of financials and I guess you know there has been years historic historically where we've been uh, well lower than projected. Um, so they assured us that this was a manageable situation but um, you can imagine if you're managing contracts and you just can't come, you know, you cannot come deliver, you're not going to get paid. Um, and it's, it's not like a, an employee employer situation. So, um, so they're going through that. They're also acknowledging that they're well ahead of the curve um, in providing online instruction to their uh, school participants. And so I, I was really happy to hear that. And I encouraged them to consider professional development um, and really be on the, uh, show member districts what cutting edge instruction looks like in an online space, what good pedagogy looks like, what asynchronous education could look like. Um, there's, although it's a very um, trying time um, for our faculty to completely redesign their curriculum, there's a lot of potential opportunity um, to be had in designing um, really good high quality educational assets that can then be used once we're back face to face. Um, so uh, they will be uh, doing that. And um, the only other thing I wanted to mention about CES um, is that, no, I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that uh, we're just lucky to be a part of um, an organization that's at the cutting edge and can provide professional development to its member districts in this time. That's great. Thanks, Humara. All right. Um, I'm going to finish out the action items here. I believe we need to still do 8E, the approval of AP warrants submitted in February 2020. Is there a motion to approve the accounts payable warrants? So moved. Second. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain. Um, and then we have an approval of the warrants uh, submitted for February 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Any questions or revisions to the uh, March 2nd, 2020 minutes? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Our next regular meeting date. Let's see. So April. Okay. Yeah. So let's make sure if we could get two on the books, get the meeting and then get a backup because this again is that public hearing. So normally that would be uh, April 27th would be the fourth Monday. Does that work for people? Sure. Just looking. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just going to stay in that day. I'm not going out. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cancel all my conferences and trips. For this. It's just for us. That yeah. decision has been made for me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The 27th works for me too. Okay. And then can we um, do a, I mean, just if something happened, if somebody either 
a, a rain date or something that could either be that week, like Wednesday or Thursday or the following Monday. I don't foresee that happening, but we never want to be in a place where um, we're headed to town meeting and um, and we don't have public Wednesday hearing. the 29th works as a backup date for me. Yeah, me too. Okay. Same. <laughs> so we would only need that if for some reason something happened and we didn't have a quorum for the 27th. So if you could just hold both of those days, then okay. Okay. we'll make sure that we get public hearing taken care of. So 5.30 via the Zoom platform? Via the Zoom platform. That is right. And uh, Chris, apparently my big fear of we need to upgrade in case we get 500 participants. Uh, I guess <laughs> I was a little worried about something that didn't come to pass. <laughs> You, you have good been at all of our past thought. meetings, right, Annie? <laughs> you, you, <laughs> I just thought in this space people would just come streaming in. But That's yeah. right. We're all set well, I will say, got, Chris. I think you've given them so many opportunities to either hear from you or communicate That's with you true. that I never expected floods of people coming here saying, what's going on? So I'm, I'm really thankful for that. I think your messages have been so well received. And just, I think uh, the fact that you've got students asking you about other modes of delivery that they want to hear from you, that's great. So it's just a testament to the, the really effective communications and uh, heartfelt messages that I think you're sending out. So it's much appreciated. No problem. This is, this is, I'm, I'm preparing for a second career. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, I'll just, I want to add one other thing and that is uh, thank you for your embracing of um, all this technology, not mm -hmm. only you, but also the district. Um, mm -hmm. What we are seeing um, in other uh, sectors um, I just had a conversation with um, Stanford educators who had a public event and advertised a public Zoom link. Um, mm -hmm. And there were, I guess it's called, maybe it's called Zoom bombing or mm -hmm. something to do with bombing. Um, but uh, there are ways you can avoid that. Um, and I'm sure you're looking into how to do that so that uh, I, I doubt, I really doubt that we'll ever have 500 people attend. But even if we just had one person who, um, who wanted to find out how to do that, um, we, we, would, we would probably not want that. On a, so a thank you to Jen Mendelson at Town Hall who called me today and introduced me to this topic and said, yeah, this is a thing and this is gonna be your first school committee meeting. So change all these settings or this thing could happen. So I don't know, like 12 years came off my life right before this, <laughs> all set, change my settings. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah. Great. All right, folks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take care, everybody. Oh, Thank you. Well. Need a motion to adjourn? Oh, yeah. Is there motion a motion? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank Good you. night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.